Do sit down. Uh, let me just pray. Father God, we thank you that uh, Jesus did come, that Jesus did die, that Jesus did rise. We thank you for the glory of Christ shown through the cross and help us, Lord, as we hear your voice speaking to us now that we might respond by being more in wonder of what Jesus has done and how Jesus continually helps us as we trust him by faith. So we thank you. Amen. Okay, good. Um, Keep your Bibles open at Mark chapter 8. That would be great. And uh, we'll just get this uh, switched on, hopefully. So Mark chapter 8 and uh, verse 22 to 38 is where we are. Okay. So our series that, um, that we're looking at in Mark's Gospel at the moment is called Your Kingdom Come. And it's all about how Jesus brings God's kingdom close, how he, in his appearing, brought God's kingdom close to people on earth. And um, we're up to uh, Mark chapter 8, and we're looking at uh, the mission of the king today. That's our title, the mission of the king. Now, I wonder if you um, walk around with your eyes open or not. Where, uh, where Sarah and I used to live, before we moved here, we were living in uh, North London. And um, the, the, the area where we lived in, actually, there were a number of uh, celebrities that lived in the, the, the places surrounding the, the, uh, the community. And um, it would, wouldn't be uncommon to um, bump into or see someone famous walking down the street. It's exciting, isn't it? But the thing is, um, whenever Sarah and I seem to be together... The person that we happened to see was someone she didn't recognize, right? So um, I'm going to test you out this morning, okay? And we're going to see if you recognize them. So we were, we were sort of quite early on. We were sitting in a, a, a restaurant um, just along the high street. And um, I said, I nudged Sarah. I said, look over there, look over there, look who is in the corner. And she looked over and she didn't know who the person was in the corner of the room with his family and friends. Now, um, I don't know if you know who that is or not. Does anybody know? Can I test you this morning? Trevor? Trevor Nelson. Who would have thought Sheila would be the one to get Trevor Nelson? The Radio 1 DJ. It's Radio 2 now, isn't he? So, you know, slightly more mature audience for myself. Trevor Nelson was there um, in the corner with his family and friends having a nice Turkish meal, right? What about this next one? We were walking along a bit of a woodland path in in the area where we lived, and we came across this lady. Does anybody know who that lady is then? Actress, Phil? Maureen Maureen Lippman. We are doing well this morning. Two out of two. Maureen Lippman, actress, stage and screen. Had many different roles. The one that I remains in my memory was her doing the British Telecom adverts. She's... Uh, she was Maureen, actually, in that, wasn't she? Yeah, so um, that's what you might recognize her from. Right. What about the next one, then? I think this will probably span the younger age a little bit more now, because we're walking along the street, and uh, I was really excited. I nudged Sarah again, and I said, look, look who's coming towards us. And she was like, I can't see anyone. I look right there. She said, but it's just a sort of a an overweight, scruffy guy just walking. I said, exactly, it's Johnny Vegas. It's so exciting. I didn't have to test you on that one, did I? Johnny Vegas was walking towards us, but she didn't recognize him. Oh, how disappointing. All these famous people around. Now, there was a time when, uh, when she would have recognized the person I bumped into, but she wasn't with me. I was standing in Sainsbury's, buying some few, few items, and behind me, buying a loaf of bread was none other than Phil Mitchell. I don't even know his real name. Does anyone know his real name? Rotten, that's not Ross Kemp, is it? Steve McFadden. There you go. We all know him as Phil Mitchell. So Sarah would have recognized him, but she wasn't there. Seeing. Do we walk around with our eyes open? Do we recognize 
the people in front of us. Well, today, the, the sort of focus of our passage is all about seeing. And we start with a story of a physical seeing, but actually it's symbolic of something much more. A spiritual seeing. Seeing with spiritual eyes who this man is, Jesus. That's what we're going to do. Have a look at verse 22. We're told that um, they, Jesus and his disciples, they came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Do you remember last week we were, we were thinking about how the fact that Jesus had now left the predominantly Jewish areas and was now in Gentile territory. Remember it was God's plan, always God's plan, for Jesus to come to the Jews first to give them the opportunity to welcome Jesus for themselves. But it was always his plan to go to the Gentiles as well. That actually Jesus is um, the king for all. He's the savior for all people, anyone that wants to know him. And so Jesus again here, as we follow on, he's in this Gentile area. Bethsaida, blind man comes to him. Look what he did. He took the blind man, verse 23, by the hand and led him outside the village. When he spat on the man's eyes and put his hand on him, Jesus asked him, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Jesus had healed him partially. Now look, occasionally we do read of Jesus using some spit and touching people on their eyes or their ears as part of his healing process. Nothing magical in those things them, of themselves. You know, Jesus healed people from a distance, didn't he? He didn't even need to be in people's presence in order to heal, just needed the word. Jesus' words were enough, they're powerful. So nothing magical here, but this is what Jesus used at this time. The man was partially healed. The fact that he likened people to trees tells us that he probably wasn't born blind, right? He knew something of what people looked like. So what was going on here? Look at what Jesus did next. Once more, Jesus put his hand on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. A partial healing and then a full healing. Jesus healed the man in two stages. Why did he do this? Why would Jesus heal in two stages? could not have been because of his limitation in his power. You know, we've seen Jesus do things instantly and immediately, right, for people. So it couldn't have been to do with that, but it must have been a purpose that Jesus had for this time. What was it he was trying to show or demonstrate or symbolize in doing this? Well, I think it's symbolic of a spiritual seeing. We'll discover that in the next part of our story. Seeing partially spiritually before seeing fully spiritually, okay? He used the man and healed him in his compassion, but he had an example to show people. So why did Jesus send the man home, telling him not to go into the village? Seems strange, doesn't it? When Mark writes these stories all about Jesus, he's got in his mind the great messianic prophecies from Isaiah about this person that was going to come and what he would be like and what he would do. For example, Isaiah 35 tells us, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. So Mark is showing in Jesus' life something true that is coming now, that's come because of Jesus. But the thing is, maybe the people, having seen Jesus in these healings, would simply treat him as a faith healer and wouldn't understand the complete picture about this messiahship of Jesus, who he really was and what he'd come to do. So Jesus said, don't go back into the village. He wanted people to get his main mission rather than get confused. It's what we come to next, the next part. So we've, we've thought about seeing, right? But we move on to understanding. Understanding, verse 27 onwards, right? We come, and as we continue the story, we see Jesus and his disciples moving on from, from Bethsaida, about 40k north. 
near the city of Caesarea Philippi. Jesus had spent a considerable amount of time with his disciples now, hadn't he? They'd left everything. Been called from their day jobs. They'd followed him. He'd given them really special exposure to his power, to his method of working, trying to reveal to them who he was, his identity, and, and, and what he was all about. He was investing in them. Do you remember that call when they, when they dropped their nets and followed him? He said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to invest in you and, and, and make you these people who are going to go and catch people for me. And now, this point of Mark's gospel is a turning point. It's a significant point in the book of Mark. Because Jesus wants to create complete clarity for them over his identity and also clarity over his mission. We're at an intersection, right? Where the first eight chapters of Mark's book primarily center around this question of who is Jesus? What is his identity? From all the episodes as you've been reading, perhaps at home as you've been coming to church and listening to the stories, all these episodes of what Jesus has been doing, it's there for us to ask the question, who is Jesus? Who is he? And the second half of the book, from just coming up onwards, centers around the question, what has Jesus come to do? What is his mission to complete? And so here we are in the middle. Caesarea Philippi is, was a large city um, at the base of the giant Mount Hermon. And the significance of this is Jesus bringing them to this place is because of this reason, I think. Uh, Back in the day when Alexander the Great ruled, um, this uh, place, uh, now called Caesarea Philippi there, was, was previously called Panias. And it was dedicated, it was an area dedicated to the, the god, the Greek god of desolate places, Pan. So it was a, it was a big cave there and you know, lots of people would, uh, would worship this god. Later on during the Roman period, Herod the Great, he built a, a, a massive temple dedicated to Caesar Augustus. And then later on, his son, Philip, um, also then built a great big city as his residence, the, the capital of, of the area where he ruled. And he named it Caesarea in honor of Caesar, but Philippi, Philip, right? Caesarea Philippi. Today, it's actually goes back to perhaps the original name, Panias. It's called Banias. That's what its name is now, that area. But Jesus brings his disciples to that place. Why? Because it was a place where over the years people had worshipped all sorts of different gods. Their idea of reaching God and, and understanding what God was like and worshipping him, that was a place where many, many gods had been worshipped. And Jesus brought his disciples into that area, perhaps because he wanted them to understand the nature of the true God. What is God really like? The true God. Who is he? What's his working like in people's lives? How is he going to reveal himself more to you so that you can get clarity in your mind about him? And so we read in verse 27. On the way, Jesus asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. Many people at that time still saw Jesus as a forerunner. They saw Jesus as the one who'd come to prepare the way for the one who was going to come. They, they thought he was just an announcer of the kingdom that was still ahead. That's who they thought. And Jesus was trying to say, look, for you guys, um, this is what people are saying about me. Well, are they right? Let's, let's get some clarity here. Jesus goes on to say, what about you? Who do you say I am? Do you agree with the crowds? Do you agree with everyone's opinion about me? You're the, you're the ones that have had more exposure to me than anyone else. You've seen me close up. Who do you really think I am? Just a prophet? Just the announcer? Who am I? 
And you know, this question is a really important question. Because we can, we can read these stories from a, a sort of an arm's length, can't we? We can look at them as historical stories and say, hey, yeah, Jesus is interacting with people here. Let's, let's see what interests us about him. But actually, this question that Jesus asked is meant to be a question for us too. So as Jesus turns to his disciples and says, okay, that's what everyone else says about me, but who do you say I am? That's meant to turn on to us as well and and ask us the question, who do I think Jesus is? So I want you to think now, from all you've ever known about Jesus, from all you've ever heard, from what we've looked at since Christmas as we look through Mark's Gospel together, all the amazing stories, who would you say he is? Who is Jesus? And if someone was to ask you that question directly, how would you express it? How would you explain who Jesus is to them and get clarity for them? As Jesus asks his disciples, Peter then answers, answers, you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. You are the Messiah, Peter says. This is all about Jesus' identity. And as Jesus turns and says, right, come on then. From all you've seen, who am I? Peter says, you are the Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting for. You are God's chosen king who's come to earth. The hope that we've all been waiting for. The climax of the first half of Mark's book is here. As Peter, the spokesperson of the twelve, recognizes who Jesus is. He's not just a signpost pointing people towards the kingdom, but he is the king who brings God's kingdom close to us. Jesus. So here we go again. Jesus warning them, telling them, don't tell anyone. Why does he do that? Surely if they've got it right, Jesus would say, well done, go on, off you go, tell everyone so they can know and be sure. Correct those people that think the wrong things about me. Surely that's what he'd say. But he says, no, don't tell anyone. Why is that? Because as we'll see, right, although Peter gets Jesus' identity right as the Messiah, Jesus also knows that there's this great expectation, this expectation of a a nationalistic character, Um, a great warrior figure that the Jews were expecting who would come and gather an army, a military figure who would then raise up an army and come and defeat the Romans and restore the kingdom to Israel. That's the person that many people thought the Messiah would be and were hoping for. So Jesus was cautious. He said, yes, okay, I am the Messiah, but can you just hold back a bit? Jesus wanted to make sure that whilst they got his identity right, they also understood his mission, what he'd come to do, and what the whole purpose of his life on earth would be about. And Jesus' caution was warranted. It was warranted. Because now his identity was established, Jesus began to teach his disciples. And he said this, He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. He spoke plainly. No more parables now. No more stories that needed interpretation. Jesus was straight in there. He was like, right, okay, that's who I am. This is what I've come to do. He was full steam ahead now for Jesus. From this point onwards, right the way through for the rest of the book, you see Jesus focused on this mission to the cross. This is his destiny, which accompanies his identity. About 100 years before this incident, there's an anonymous writer who expresses something of who the Jews expected their Messiah to be like when he came. This is what, this is what he wrote. Behold, O Lord, and raise up for them a king, the son of David, and gird him with strength that he might shatter unrighteous rulers, 
and that he might purge Jerusalem from nations that trample her down to destruction. He shall have the heathen nations to serve him under his yoke. Wow. You know, when Jesus spoke plainly about this, what was Peter's response this time? He was offended. He was deeply offended. In fact, we read here that Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. This is the Messiah that was going to trample down his enemies. And Jesus is saying he's going to die on a cross. No. How can this be? Jesus, you're the Messiah who's going to gather the army and, and basically in your victory you will have blood on your clothes, but it will be the blood of your enemies. Not the blood of defeat from your own self on the cross. No. Peter didn't get it. He couldn't get and grasp those prophecies about a suffering Messiah. Didn't understand. And so Peter, as he rebuked Jesus and basically told him off, one breath he's praising him for the Messiah, the next minute he's telling him off. Jesus then turns and looks at his disciples. And Jesus knows exactly who's at work here. He knew who was influencing the eleven and Peter, stopping them from receiving this news of the mission of the king. Jesus turned and he rebuked Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus knew that it was Satan at work. Do you remember we talked about the devil last week? We were thinking in your small groups this week about how the enemy wants to disrupt. He wants to confuse. He wants to draw people away from understanding and knowing Christ. Jesus knew his tactic. And Satan has been at work throughout Jesus' life up till now and beyond this point. He was at work in the wilderness when Jesus was tempted by the devil who wanted to distract him from, from going to the cross. Actually, the devil wanted to clothe him in earthly glory so that Jesus wouldn't accept the mission of suffering. We saw it early on as well in Mark's Gospel when Jesus was busy with all the people coming to him that needed his help and wanted healing. Actually, what did the devil want to do? He wanted to distract Jesus from his task. He was happy for him to do some healings around the place because he knew that whilst that could help some people, it wouldn't help them for eternity. Do you remember Jesus spent that time with his father? He took time out all the time regularly to seek his father in prayer and have dependence on him to remember his priorities. Jesus, we see here, was... Um, so concerned about the influence on Peter and the disciples because Satan basically wanted to almost convince Jesus that yes, he could live up to that expectation of being the warrior Messiah. Jesus is like, no, that's not it. You've got it wrong. Later on when Jesus is in the garden um, of Gethsemane just before his death and he's in agony saying to his father, Lord, if there's any way to take this cup of suffering from me, please do it. And in fact, the devil would have wanted nothing more than Jesus walking away at that point. But Jesus knew his mission. He knew it. He knew there would be pain ahead. He knew that the salvation of man was at stake. He knew that his death meant everything for mankind. And so Jesus did it for us. He did it for you. And he did it for me. Jesus died on the cross because he knew that that was all he had to do. That was his main mission. And without it, we would be lost forever. Our sin and those things in our hearts, the dirtiness that we cannot clean up, the forgiveness that we need more than anything from God can only come through the cross. And Jesus knew it. And he was prepared to go through it. He fulfilled what Isaiah the prophet said about him, that he would be a man of sorrows, familiar with pain. But Jesus embraced the pain. He embraced the cross. And he did it for you. And if you haven't come to that point yet, of truly, truly trusting in Jesus, and accepting that the cross is the only way, 
if you've been around church for a long time, but you've held Jesus at arm's length still, please don't do it any longer. You may have even used the words of Christianity. You might have even talked about the cross or Jesus, but yet you haven't yet really put your trust in him. Please do it today. Jesus died for you. You know, the healing of the blind man came in two stages, didn't it? And the disciples' sight would come in two stages. Well, various stages probably. They got it a little bit now, didn't they? They saw a little bit. They saw that he was the Messiah. They got a bit right. A bit like that man seeing people, but they looked like trees. The disciples could see a bit, but they couldn't see fully. Earlier on, when when Jesus was um, speaking in parables, he said to his disciples that he'd given them the secret of the kingdom of heaven, that actually they could see more than many others around them, but yet they were still struggling. And their sight would only come over time. In fact, really their sight, their spiritual sight, and their vigor for, for Christ would really only come after the resurrection. And after Jesus ascended and the Holy Spirit was poured down on them, they were transformed men, weren't they? They lived for Christ fully then. They could see it. But not quite yet. They could only see a bit. You know, um, just after Ben started school, uh, primary school, Sarah came home uh, one day from the park after school. It had been been a nice day. She was playing uh, playing with Ben at the park and uh, met a few people there. And she said, Came home and said to me, uh, said, I really met a really nice guy at the park today. Um, granddad of one of the, the girls in Ben's class. Really lovely guy. We were chatting for a while and uh, catching up and whatever. And, and he happened to say that um, he used to play football. And um, he thought you might be interested in that. And he mentioned Ipswich Town. And um, yeah, have a look. So I ran upstairs to go and get my Times Illustrated History of Football which you would need because he was a bit older, okay? And um, I opened up the page. I remember the, the name that Sarah gave me and around about the year that he mentioned he used to play. And I opened it up and there was a picture of him playing. Some of you might know, recognize the face of the guy there. He lives just around here. Ray Crawford, his name is. And he won the league with Ipswich Town, 1962. Played for England a couple of times as well. And I rushed downstairs and I said to Sarah, look, here's the picture, here's the photo, look, can you see now, can you see? Yes, he's a lovely guy, a nice granddad, lives in the community, but look, can you see? Can you see him more clearly? This is Ray Crawford, won the league. You can see, and then you can see. With Jesus, we can see, but can we really see? Can we really see who he is? Can we really understand and grasp and take hold of what he's done for us? Can we really open our minds and have our eyes and our hearts open to him to see Jesus and to respond to him? So seeing, understanding, but also following. Look look at the next part. I want us to think about following because Jesus' original call to his disciples to leave all he had and follow him, now he expands on what it means to be a true follower of Jesus. And as we look at these verses 34 to 38, they're very challenging. So please, stay with me. Don't get distracted. Stick with it because Jesus has got something to say to us here. Very important things. As Jesus talks about what it means to be a true follower, here's some of the things that he says. I've entitled them for us to to help, hopefully. The first thing is this. Put Jesus first. Verse 34. He called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Jesus has just dropped a bombshell, hasn't he? He's dropped a bombshell that his life would be defined by the cross. That it was crucial to get it. If you you can't get that, you can't get Jesus. 
But he now goes on to say that the life of anyone who wants to be a disciple of his, a true follower of his, their life must also be defined by the cross. So following Jesus the Messiah would not result in power, but it would result in crucifixion. What does he mean by that? That we must literally die for him? Well, if you know anything about the world, for some people who are Christians, that is exactly what it means. In some parts of the world, it is immensely dangerous to be a Christian. And to be known as a Christian means that your life is at stake. You've been following the prayer diary. Our, our, um, our mission of the month is open doors and lots of entries in there about how we can pray for believers um, in, in countries where it's really not safe. So entries about Afghanistan and Libya and India have been up there in the last week or so. But keep praying for people who are Christians in countries where it's dangerous. For the disciples here, taking up their cross literally meant sacrificing their worldly expectation of a warrior Messiah, yeah, the one that they thought the Messiah was going to be like. They had to give that up, give up that idea. And actually following Jesus in the end for them meant actually the opposite, pretty much the opposite of that. Rather than the kingdom of Israel being restored to the Jews, actually, by following Jesus, these guys were, had to give up their lives and that hope and literally lose everything. And as you read the stories of the disciples, you read some of the stories of how they actually lost their lives, literally lost their lives for Christ. But the essence here for us if we're not in their situation, if we're not in a country where it's dangerous to be a Christian, this is the essence of it. The essence is this. We have to crucify our worldly desires for ourselves. To crucify the desire to shape our life our way. And not to have a me-shaped life, but to have a cross-shaped life. A life that is centered on Jesus Christ and then says, actually, my life is not about me, but it's about Jesus now. That's what it means to be a Christian and to put our trust in him and to follow him. Being a Christian is not just praying a prayer. It's not simply a get out of jail free card when I die, but nothing changes in my life right now. No, it isn't about that. Being a Christian is about having a new focus. It's about having a new hope. It's about having a new desire. It's about having a new life that is based all around Jesus. He's at the center now. And we're glad about that. Paul writes in Colossians, he literally writes in chapter 3, Christ is your life. So I want to turn that back on us this morning and ask you this question. Is Christ your life? Is he? Even if you call yourself a Christian, if you say you follow Jesus, is Christ your life? Is he the one who shapes you? Is he the one that you build your life upon? Is he the one affecting your decisions and your desires? As Jesus willingly made a sacrifice for us, he calls us to willingly make sacrifice for him out of our lives. So are we living for ourselves or him? Are there things in our lives which are taking Jesus' place? Are there idols that can be very subtle, can't they? Because they, they just gently squeeze Jesus out of centre place. They might start off as good things, but actually become more, more important to us than him himself. Maybe it's our habits and our lifestyle. Maybe the way that we've lived and those ingrained things actually are at the risk of pushing Jesus out and he is not the one shaping us. But we might use the words of Christianity. But it's just a surface thing. Here's the challenge. And I think it came up in the words of one of the songs earlier about surrendering. That word surrender is such an important word. Jesus is calling us today to surrender. Surrender our lives to him. Lay those things down that are causing us to stumble. You know, you can't carry your cross if you're holding on tightly to other things. There's not enough room, is there? 
You've got to lay those things down at the foot of the cross in order to pick your cross up and say, no, Jesus is the one I'm living for now. He's the one I'm really going to go for. Just as Jesus was so focused at this point and saying, this is where I'm going, we can say, yes, Jesus, as I trust you, this is where I am going because you're at the heart of everything that I'm doing. Put Jesus first. That's what he says. And as he carries on to expand on this, He's basically saying it is a matter of life and death. Verse 35, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? In a thousand AD, nearly 200 years after he died, people opened up the tomb of the Emperor Charlemagne, or Charles the Great as he was known. He was the king of the Franks and the Christian emperor of the the West. And he was one of the most powerful men alive. And as they opened up his tomb, they saw an amazing thing. Amongst all the treasures and the jewels and the worldly wealth that was buried in there with him, they looked beyond it and they saw something astonishing. Charlemagne himself was sat on his throne, crown on his head, and on his lap lay a Bible. And there was a bony finger that had its finger right on top of some words of the Bible. As they went over to look at the Bible, they saw that his finger was pointed at Mark 8, 36. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Couldn't take anything with him, could he? Very evident from that truth there. But I want to ask you this question. What means the world to you? What means the world to you? Look, we can chase the world for all it can offer. But if we do that, then our reward will remain in this world. It's as far as it will go. What are you at risk of trading your soul for very sharp words from jesus here aren't there very straightforward very plain very plain what are we risking right now what's the trade-off between the things that we might go for compared to the things that we could go for for christ losing our lives in this world means giving up the selfish way that says me first but puts jesus and the gospel first Our soul is so precious to Jesus, so precious. Are we in danger of giving it up too lightly and not valuing it as Jesus values it? If we trust in Jesus, the good news is this. The gospel itself says that when we trust in him and live our lives for him, that is completely the way that we save our lives. If we grip wholly onto things in the world, actually that's how we'll lose it. Give it up, follow Christ. And you'll gain everything that he has to offer you. So if Jesus said to do something, would you do it? If you're a Christian, would you do it? Because it's astonishing, isn't it, how we can say we're Christians, and yet when Jesus, through the word of God, through scripture itself, When the Bible tells us something, it's amazing how easy it is for us to disobey, isn't it? And to ignore him. So let's be open to challenge from Jesus. Let's be open to challenge from God's word as to the things that perhaps are our things that we're gripping onto too tightly that we say, actually, I'll be a Christian. Yeah, I can say I'll follow Jesus, but I won't give that up. It's too precious to me. What might it be for you? Is it material? Monetary things? Possessions? Certain relationships that are more precious to you? It might be a good relationship, but it takes Jesus' place. It might be a relationship that's forbidden by Scripture because it's not good for us. It's not God's way. 
It might be that we hold actually on to what we're used to in life, whether it's our comfort or whether it's our lifestyle, whether it's our habits. We're so used to living in a certain way that we can't give it up. It might be our character traits that actually we can't almost give over to Jesus. We say, Lord Jesus, would you take my anger issue? There's a deep-rooted problem, Jesus, but I need your help. And I'm not going to hold on to that, but I'm going to allow you into my life. I'm going to allow you, Lord, to, to take those things, my attitudes, looking down on others, control of my life, and actually say, Jesus, come in, come in, because I want you to make that difference. You know, Lent, the period of Lent is a great opportunity, isn't it? It's a great opportunity for us to realize the sacrifice Jesus went through and for us to consider what is it in my life that needs to be given over? What do I need to sacrifice right now for Christ to show him that he means more to me than anything else? What do you need to consider through Lent to give over to Christ? And perhaps it's something you've never had the courage yet to do. Maybe you've never quite let Jesus into that part of your life. This would be a great time to do it. It'd be a great time to do it. Repentance. Repentance. Repent and believe. Jesus said, repent and believe. Continually repent and believe. That's the way of a true disciple. I would love it. It would thrill my heart so much if there were people that were prepared to say, yes, this is what I'm going to do to give something over for Jesus. This part of my life, this period in my life where I've not had the courage to do it before. And if you want to come and talk to me and we'll pray it through and we'll work it through, that would be no shame in doing that. Do you know what, men? Yeah, real men would admit their weakness. They would admit it before God and before someone trusted to them and be accountable to them and actually allow Jesus in. Because it's the women here often that are the ones that will talk and want to deal with things, but men are often so closed. Please, guys, don't. Don't leave it anymore. You've got a problem with pornography. Come and talk. We'll pray. We'll work it through. Come on, Jesus is worth it. Don't risk your soul. As a Christian band once said, life is short, can end so fast. To build it on the truth that lasts, we will help. We want to help. Jesus will help. Because this is the last thing. Following Jesus, what does it mean? Jesus will judge and reward. Jesus said, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the Holy Angels. There's a warning there, isn't there? There's a warning that Jesus is going to come back and judge. And that if we're ashamed of him by the words that we use or the words that we don't use or the life that we live now, actually it shows us the heart of who we are. We're saved by grace, but the fruit of our life shows and reveals our salvation to people, doesn't it? If our lives don't match up to what we say as a Christian, we have to ask ourselves that question, am I really Christ's? Make a decision today. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Speak words of life that are faithful to him. Live a life of faithfulness to him. Because the, the flip side to this warning is a great encouragement to us. There's a sure promise that living for Jesus is worth it. Because look, one day Jesus is coming back. The promise to you if you're a Christian is that his spirit, the Holy Spirit, lives inside us and transforms us and helps us to live a life for Christ now, and it's a great joy. But you know what? The greatest reward is to come, and Jesus is coming. He's coming back in glory with his angels, and he will take you to be with him, and it will be that day when you say, I was so pleased. I am so pleased that I put my faith in him. It was worth it after all. I did not make a mistake. Jesus is taking with me. This is the hope that I've always been longing for. I'm going to be with him. 
That's what's going to happen. And when you follow him and your life is cross-shaped and Jesus returns, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come. Come into your inheritance. Martin Luther said, the cross we bear before the crown we wear. And it's true, isn't it? There'll be some suffering. There'll be some sacrifice in life. But hey, what does it matter? Because for Jesus, it's worth it. So there's lots of encouragements in there today, isn't there? And there's lots of challenges as well. And that's what Jesus is like. <laughs> he wants to reassure his, his disciples. He wants to reassure those that are his. But he also wants to sharpen us because he wants us to be more fully the people that he made us to be. And I would love it. I would love over these next few weeks, if you've got stories of how Jesus is transforming your life, what he's been doing in your life recently, how he's speaking to you, how he's changing you, how he's drawing you to be closer to himself. I'd love to hear those stories. Small group leaders, please, you know, talk about those things together with your small groups. Come and share them with me. It'd be great to share some stories on Sundays about what Jesus is doing to encourage us as a church to know that he's at work and we can trust him and praise him. So let's pray now. Thank him for all he is to us. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that your identity is as the Messiah. You came as the Father promised. You came and you fulfilled all those prophecies. Significantly, Lord Jesus, you came and fulfilled those prophecies that said you would suffer, that you would die, but that you would rise. We thank you and praise you that you fulfilled it all and that you are working in your followers now. We thank you that the cross is available to all. Help us to respond to you today as you have spoken to us that we might be changed and not just the same as we were, but to become more like you, Lord Jesus. Praise you. Amen.